Welcome everyone uh, to our webinar on documenting long COVID for disability determination. My name is Pam Hines, Senior Project Associate with the SAMHSA SORTA Center, and I'll be your moderator uh, today. Just a few items to go through before we begin the content. The views, opinions, and content expressed in this presentation do not necessarily reflect the views, opinions, or policies of the Center for Mental Health Services, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, or the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Here are some brief instru webinar instructions. So the slides and materials are available on the SOAR website. Um, they're also in your registration invitation that you received uh, prior to the event. This is being recorded and it will be available in about uh, a week at, at the above link, uh, but also on YouTube uh, to follow. Uh, the questions, we'll be taking some questions at the end of all of the presentations and you can you know, begin submitting questions using the Q&A feature. And your lines will all be muted and the chat feature is also disabled during this presentation. And at the conclusion of the webinar, we have an evaluation that your, your browser will automatically redirect you to. So we really kindly ask you to take that survey. It also gives you an opportunity to ask, uh, pose questions if you weren't able to do it uh, few, um, via the Q&A function. We also do have ASL interpretation. Dave and Katie will be doing that for us. In addition to Leora, who will be providing closed captioning as well, which you can access. So the objective of our webinar today is to really learn more about the impact of COVID-19 infection and how it can lead to what's called long COVID disability impairment, both physical and mental, and, and really increase your understanding of the impact of long COVID impairment on the usual disability determination process and how to represent SOAR applicants with long COVID-related uh, symptoms and impairment. To help us reach those objectives, we're really fortunate to have on our web webinar today, Dr. Scott Pritchard, who is the lead medical consultant uh, with the Oregon Disability Determination Services, and he provides uh, training to DDS examiners and medical doctors as well. Jessica Stadmeyer, who is a SOAR Benefits Coordinator with the Vener Veterans Leadership Program in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, along with Rob, who is a SOAR Benefits beneficiary uh, who was assisted through uh, the SOAR model. So we'll be hearing from Rob as well. And then to round things off, we have Julie Kujap, who is a Nevada DDS claims examiner, who will talk a little bit about um, how Social Security is working through these types of cases and what to expect. Um, and you can read more about um, all of our presenters. Uh, their biographies are avail available on the SOAR website. Um, under webinars for this webinar. So I really encourage you to take a look and read about their extensive experience. Um, and then Q&A, as I said before, will be facilitated by us at the SAMHSA SORTA Center at the end of all of the presentations. Okay, so doing today's welcome, we are so lucky to have uh, Doreen Gross, who is our project officer at SAMHSA. Doreen? Yes. Thank you, Pam, and a, um, a warm welcome to all of you for joining us today. Um, on behalf of SAMHSA, which is the Substance Abuse for Mental Health Services Administration, I would like to uh, welcome you to the SOAR webinar titled Documenting Long COVID for Disability Determination. In a speech in July of last year, President Biden declared long COVID a disability under the Americans with Disabilities Act, also known as ADA. And, launch, and launched a set of policies designed to help COVID long hauler, haulers needing accommodation for school or work, as well as the many as many who cannot work at all. While the, uh, while the Social Security Administration is considering new guidance on long COVID, this webinar will share current data and research on how COVID-19 has impacted the, uh, use, the usual disability process so that SOAR practitioners can, can understand how to best document these claims. To help you put this information into practice, uh, we'll, we will hear from a SOAR practitioner and um, a, a SOAR uh, beneficiary with long, long COVID on how they, they successfully navigate the disability determination process. I would like to welcome you and 
thank our presenters for your willingness to share your experience, um, expertise and experience with long COVID with us. I'll turn it back over to Pam Hine, um, who will be moderating today's webinar. Thanks again for your uh, continued support of our webinar series. And now to kick us off, we have Dr. Pritchard, who will begin his presentation. Dr. Pritchard? Excellent. Uh, well, uh, thank you, everyone, and thank you for attending. Uh, and I want to thank uh, uh, Pam and her uh, group to, uh, for the kind invitation to speak today. Uh, one of my roles as a lead consultant uh, for uh, the program is to educate and train all, all analysts, MCs, and anyone else who will listen to me basically about, uh, you know, about pertinent medical topics and also uh, about the program in itself. So today, before I start, I must tell you that uh, the views that I express today and any of the slides are definitely my own and not those of Social Security Administration. Uh, I am receiving no compensation from any pharmaceutical company or any compensation for my presentation today. Okay, so let's move on. Um, so am I going to move the slides here? Is that how it's going to work? Um, we can do oh, that. Yeah, here it is. Like. I got it. I got, got it. it. All right. Great. It's going to work. Okay. So uh, before we start, I thought, we, you know, what are we talking about? What is long? What is COVID? You know, we've heard so much about this over the last couple of years. And uh, we know it's been deadly and there's been a lot of fears and a lot of misinformation. So what I'm going to try and do is explain to you what exactly uh, COVID is, how it was named, and, you know, how we see it in, in the environment and within uh, the population itself. So what made COVID so different is that it's a novel virus, you know, never been seen before. It's named because it's a coronavirus, CO, virus VI, and it's ID'd in 2019. Therefore, we have COVID-19. It is in the family of SARS, and maybe you've heard about SARS infections. One occurred in the early 2000s, and, but it was far less deadly with only about 778 peoples worldwide that were affected and actually died from the disease. I think that included eight individuals in the U.S. So, you know, you can see for yourself that all viruses, though we have them, you know, they're not always as pathogenic. Uh, it's a family of coronavirus, typically presented in the upper respiratory symptoms. So when you have flu, you basically have, you know, a runny nose, sore throat, cough, congestion. If you have gastrointestinal or stomach symptoms or gastroenteritis, it's more a virus of the lower intestinal tract. So I think often people will call, you know, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, the flu, but in, in, by definition, it really is, and it's an upper respiratory infection. And it can be mild. It can proceed to cough and also severe uh, PNAs, pneumonia, and respiratory failure. And one of the things about uh, COVID-19 uh, or CODE-2 is the fact that it was very pathogenic, and a lot of these individuals ran, uh, ended up on life support. They were intubated in our respiratory uh, ventilatory systems. They received... Uh, ECMO, which is extracorporeal membrane oxygenation, where the blood was actually taken and circulated through a machine to oxygenate it until the lungs themselves recovered. And often they also require dialysis. So this was a multi-organ, very, very severe infection. It's very uh, uh, predominant within uh, the environment itself, and it specifically affects only humans or animals, no other uh, effect, no other animals or species are affected. It's named for the corona-like or crown-like appearance of the virus, and I have a graphic of that coming up. And both COVID-1 and 2 are pathogenic, actually, they will cause illness. So that's kind of the, what COVID is in itself. And uh, just a quick note about, uh, I, I, I entitled my speech or talk about a 21st century uh, post-viral syndrome. Well, you know, there's many kinds out there and we've all lived with them for years and don't really think about them. I think commonly one that you may or may not hear about is shingles or herpes zoster. That's a post-viral infection. People that have shingles or herpes zoster have had chicken pox and the virus has lived uh, within the nervous system 
for years and for whatever reason, it could be 50 years later, the immune system fails and this virus reactivates and can cause a painful uh, blistering rash. There's been post polio syndrome. So uh, almost any virus can cause a post viral syndrome but they all occurred before this century. So this is new. And what makes it difficult is that it is new and it's hard to recognize. There's not a lot of information out there. So quite often providers don't always know exactly what they're thinking about or what they're looking at. And so that's what makes it, uh, I think, hard right now to diagnose and then ultimately treat. Another uh, viral syndrome that uh, you've probably heard about is chronic fatigue syndrome, and this kind of evolved in the 1980s, mid-1980s, and that was linked to an Epstein-Barr virus outbreak. And these individuals quite often had mononucleosis or some type of Epstein-Barr virus uh, infection, and quite often, as a consequence, they developed this chronic fatigue syndrome. So these syndromes have been around a long time, but uh, right now, the one we're going to talk about, and it's new, is our long COVID. So let's move on to the next slide here. Um, here we go. So what are the symptoms? Uh, usually, you know, once you're exposed, and remember, it's a respiratory droplet-driven uh, infection. And, uh, you know, for years, uh, everyone, or for the whole of pandemic, we talked about a six-feet spacing. I think in reality, most viruses and droplets uh, will travel three feet with a sneeze. So the six feet was, I think, a very safe uh, distance and kind of arbitrary in that manner. So once you're exposed, you develop, you know, classic flu symptoms, fever, chills, cough, shortness of breath, fatigue, uh, myalgias, uh, any, is a muscle ache or pain. Whenever, whenever you see algae, it means pain, sore throat, and of course, congestion. So it just sounds like kind of the common cold, but in this case, because of all the tissues affected, it can become much more severe. The difficulty is too, is that a lot of people had COVID and had no symptoms, and some had COVID and were acutely ill and ultimately died. So uh, it has a wide spectrum of symptoms and how it can affect the individual. Pam, are you there? Oops, there it goes. Okay, so this is our COVID. And as you can see, it is kind of a round virus. And if you look right here, here is the uh, corona part of this and the crown. So if you use your imagination, it's round. It has kind of a crown on top. You can imagine that it's bejeweled. But this is the spike-like uh, virus protein that is circulating and is typically spread through the respiratory system. And what happens is, is that these little fingers are called the spike proteins. And they are the spike proteins that actually will bind to the receptors in the tissues that actually, you know, start and increase and start off this whole process to cause the infection. So this is kind of our player, you know, uh, and so if we look at our next slide, I think we're back on track here. Um, and the thing I wanted to think about, the spike proteins will bind to receptors in the tissues. And most of these receptors are in lung, kidney, heart, uh, all these different areas. And that's why. Uh, we okay. So while uh, Dr. Pritchard, we're hoping we can get Dr. Pritchard back online uh, to continue his presentation, because I know he's educating all of us and raising awareness on what long COVID is. And his slide, the slides are available. We just put the link up to the slides uh, that are available. We're going to move ahead to our next presenter who will really uh, and that will be Jessica and Rob. So Jessica and Rob, if you just want a camera up and unmute yourselves, we'll get to hear from a sore practitioner and Rob, who is a veteran on their experience navigating social security disability um, and, and just give us some tips on how to recognize symptoms and also how to develop the case um, since this is such a new area. So I'm just gonna forward to Jessica's slides 
and uh, hopefully we'll get Dr. Pritchard on who will make some of the information that Jessica talks about a little bit more understandable. So Jessica, are you ready to, to do your presentation? Yes, we're ready. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Um, thank you for inviting us to the webinar. I currently work at Better Leadership Program, and I was hired about two months ago. Jessica, Jessica, you're cutting in and out again, kind of like in the beginning when we first um, logged in, if you want to get maybe closer to your mic to see if that'll help. Okay, let me know if this is better. Sounds better. Okay. Um, I don't know where it cut out, so I'll kind of just start over. Um, yeah. I currently work at Veterans Leadership Program, and I was hired about two years ago um, as a service coordinator um, in assisting our veterans with applying for SSI and SSDI. So they hired me as their SOAR coordinator. Um, we serve over 7,200 veterans a year um, in a variety of services, housing, um, career development, supportive services, which can really be an array of, of uh, resources that we provide. Um, and we service 30 counties. So. Um, we get a lot of referrals, and um, Rob was referred um, to SOAR, and primary diagnosis was COVID-19. Um, I, I would say a, a major factor in screening him and gathering some information from him, um, which took some time because there was a lot of information to collect, was just being very thorough and um, really asking follow-up questions. And I have to say, Rob was very organized. He knew his, his medical um, history. Um, he had information in front of him, records in front of him that he referred to. Um, and we talked a lot. Like we would have conversations that were a few hours long. Um, just making sure that I, getting his, right, his history um, before COVID, during, you know, the, the treatment, and, and now where he's at, well, where he was a few months ago when he referred to me, as well as where he's at now. Um, so I think just taking that time to really um, sit with him, let him talk about uh, what the process was for him is extreme important. Um, to as SOAR um, coordinators, we need to really take that time to establish that rapport um, and make sure we're really, really listening and acknowledge, you know, what they've been through. Um, you know, just ask questions and really get his his story and how it's affecting his life has affected and, and continues to affect his life. Um, I think another major piece uh, when working with really any client, but especially with uh, individuals with COVID, since it is such a um, condition that we're still learning so much about, is staying in communication with the applicant and with the adjudicators throughout the entire process. Making sure, you know, anytime Rob would have an appointment or um, he, he has physical therapy still, uh, if there was any change with medication, um, I would, would, would update me. But he, basically, he was the perfect candidate. Communication with which is, which is so important. Um, and I would make sure I updated her and you know, I made sure that I reached out to the and asked if there was anything I could assist with, any um, records that were still needed, and just really make sure we um, continue to communicate throughout the whole process. Um, I want to give Rob a chance to kind of share his story um, because he, he's going to tell it best um, since he's been through it. Um, okay this a little bit. So I'd like to thank everybody for having me today. Um, it's a uh, 
my pleasure to be assisting with my story. As I know, um, a lot of people, caseworkers, and they don't get to hear it. Um, well, I'll go as short and sweet as I can, but detailed as I can. Please, uh, anybody, let me know if you have trouble hearing me. One of my um, symptoms, long-term COVID, is my vocal cords uh, damage through the intubation and the ventilation, ventilated I was on. Uh, so as Dr. Richard had touched on, I pretty much went through a lot of those core symptoms um, of severe COVID at the time. Um, I was working full-time at Lowe's um, through the first year of COVID in 2020, no problem. But we were a mission essential store. So as everything else closed, we stayed open, got those crowds in, which definitely increased my exposure. Uh, but come April 2021, I did uh, come down with the symptoms of COVID. I had just gotten my first uh, Pfizer shot vaccine, and then I had symptoms uh, just days after. And I called in to the, like, ask a nurse. And uh, they're like, those are just vaccine symptoms. Don't worry about them. Little did I know I had full on COVID, but I continued to go to work and my symptoms worsened day to day for five days straight to where I was out of breath on that fifth day and called the EMT with my basically last breath. I had like 20% um, oxygen when they picked me up um, in four different medical units, hospitals, uh, life flooded from one to another. When one hospital decided they didn't have the resources, finally I got to a hospital that had resources. So they did intubate me. I was in a coma for two months. I was ventilated. As Dr. Pritchard had um, mentioned, I was also on the ECMO machine, which is the very severe um, life-saving machine probably help me out. Um, but that does allow your heart and lungs to rest while the machine does the work of oxygen oxygenating your butt, pumping it back in. So I was in a prone position, which is face down and in a coma for two months while the machines did the work. And that's what really left me with some pretty detrimental long-term disabilities that I'm with today. Now, medically, organ-wise, my lungs are permanently damaged. Um, there's haziness in the lungs from x-rays. I now have um, low oxygen levels all the time. I'm just a few units away from them putting me on home oxygen still today. I still see doctors today. It's a year and a half later. Um, I'm in a uh, COVID recovery unit now, still currently, and I'm also had started up physical therapy again um, since the COVID attack. And since I was released from my four months at the hospital, I've been doing nothing but um, physical therapy and recovery at home, back at the VA, which is where I get all my treatment. Um, and like I mentioned, I'm still going through new specialized doctors now who are still finding new things wrong with me a year and a half after my COVID on onset. Um, as of this month, I still have to go and get nerve damage um, check uh, because I have atrophy in my hands and arms and muscles. A lot of that is from being prone that extensive amount of time. Um, I was, like I said, my arms were tucked in and my face and legs were down. I got pressure wounds, 17 of them, similar to the one on my cheek, all over my body from being prone for that long time. Uh, but my challenges today are, are the, the lungs, you know, trying to keep them as healthy and strong as I can. I do breathing exercises still today daily. I, I check in with my own um, uh, visual webinars with my doctors from home, um, weekly, bi-weekly. 
um, still today. And like I said, we are still discovering um, things that I had no idea that I was still suffering. Um, but as I stand today, I am here in front of everyone, which I am blessed to be. Um, it, it, it took it took a uh, it took a city, that's for sure. Um, but you know, not without still some setbacks. And the thing for me was the financials. That was the hardest. Um, I was on short term disability with Lowe's for six months. Once that six months ended, short term disability ended, and they terminated me because I was obviously unable to physically go to work. I was still in and out of hospitals, home treatment. Um, so then I applied for um, unemployment and I was turned down for that because of my condition. They first said that I was granted unemployment due to a leave of absence due to a health or illness. But then five minutes later, they sent a second letter saying due to your disability, you're unable to seek out work tomorrow if it presented itself. So you're denied um, uh, unemployment. So I appealed that, went to court, lost it for the same reasons again. They approved it, then they disapproved. So I never did get unemployment. So at that point, I had burned through my um, little 401k. I had built up with Lowe's to live off of for that year after short-term disability ran out. And luckily, um, through the help of Jessica and the VLP, I feel very fortunate that uh, with her knowledge through um, in a sore rep, all this helped push my paperwork through um, from the time that uh, the SSA received my, <clears throat> excuse me, paperwork, I had a decision in seven months and it was a positive decision. Uh, <clears throat> I am currently receiving monthly disability. Uh, my payment started in October, so I'm actually on my third payment now. Um, and it was, as Jessica mentioned, a very easy process for me, just keeping her updated with everything. And she was correct in saying, anytime I got a letter in the mail, anytime something changed medically, I updated her. And I know she did, she had to do on her end. And I think through that support, is why I think I was wanting you know, to have my application go through um, in such a timely manner. As we all know, I hear those horror stories, people applying for disability and it taking years and denials and re reapplying. I went through on the first shot and, you know, seven months is a big victory to me. I didn't know where to turn if that didn't go through where I'd be today because I had zero income. I'm physically unable um, due to my oxygen levels and atrophy. And I can't raise my arms and I have trouble walking. So if disability didn't come through for me. It, I, again, I don't know where I would be. So um, I'm grateful um, that the process worked for me through the VLP, through Jessica's support. Um, and I like to close out by just saying, you know, if anybody has any questions of me, um, of, of, um, my COVID process or the social security process, please ask away. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rob, for sharing your story. You're helping so many. And we've received a few questions that are thanking you for your service. And I think that's in addition to your military service, your service while at Lowe's, um, helping us get the things that we needed early in the pandemic. So we thank you for your service there as well. And I've learned by knowing that um, it's, you know, COVID's more than just a respiratory illness. It's connected to all of, you know, those other body systems um, that you are having tr problems with. I know that Jessica also is, is assisted and has a pending claim for an individual with long COVID um, who 
actually it's exacerbating existing medical conditions. Can you talk about that a little bit, Jessica? Sure. Um, that veteran, his, his first name is Scott. Um, so I received a referral for him just two months ago. He was actually a car sales. Um, and because of and some of um, medical conditions he has now, longer able. Um, after talking with adjudicator, um, uh, after talking with adjudicator and discussing his medical records and his information, um, we we are expecting to see the decision within a, probably a month now. Um, and it, um, it seems, I got the impression from what the adjudicator was kind of saying, um, that he, that he pretty, uh, it will be a positive for this veteran. So, um, I also wanted to mention about Rob, he actually was approved for back pain as well. So the onset of his disability, um, Social Security determined that to be um, April of 2021. So he was approved for his monthly SSDI, as well as a very large lump sum of back. So that's, um, that's, that's a pretty huge thing to do. That's really great to hear about the back pay, Rob. Also, if there's one takeaway that you want uh, the audience to go away with, that you think it's important for them to take away from your presentation, what would that be? Um, just to be mindful and um, open, open-minded that there are these long-term COVID cases out there and I know we all hear about it and everybody's I have long term COVID and I have a cough that will go away. Those are those are symptoms are long COVID condition. But there are a few of us who made it through who were only given a twenty percent chance success rate when they went in the hospital. They come out on the other end, but they banged up from it. And in, and in that process, my daily life, my work life, the way I do things, everything, my whole life has changed. I have to adapt it for the rest of my life. You know, so any support provided by anybody um, to help assist me in my future ongoings, you know, what you guys do is greatly appreciated. And please, you know, just understand that you know, there, there are some very severe cases, uh, recipients who do need help and, and have no other avenues. They, they, they ran out of avenues. Um, so your help is, is very important, very appreciated on, on our end. And, and that's what I, I would to take away from my end, knowing that work is very appreciated and very needed. So thank you, everyone. How about you, Jessica, before we let you sign off, because I know you have a hard stop um, to get to another appointment. What takeaway would you like folks to better understand when they work with applicants that may have COVID infection and some symptoms and they're not even sure where they're coming from? For folks that have been hospitalized, even maybe individuals not hospitalized with the other individual you worked with? I would say um, be persistent. Um, I, my background is social work, so uh, uh, I've always been better advocate for others than I am myself. So, you know, when we have individuals who, I mean, just think of a day when you're not feeling well. Um, and that, not to minimize what, what Rob's been through, but 
you know, everything he's been through, he needed somebody to advocate for him. Not that he couldn't speak for himself, but somebody who could advocate for him, um, continue to push for him, go above and beyond, and make sure that we're trying to gather every little bit of information because nothing is too small. I mean, everything wait. And sometimes, if individually, they might not seem like it could be disabling for a person. When you bring it all together, it can really uh, have a huge impact. I just wanted to thank you again and, and wish you well, uh, Rob, with your continued recovery with PT and OT and everything that you're doing, um, you know, to recover and get back to work soon. I'm sure that's one of your goals as I see you nod. So again, thanks again, and, and we'll be in touch with you soon. And we are going to now kick it back to Dr. Pritchard, who will ask you to camera up. And I brought you back to, I believe, the slide where we, um, where you ended, if that makes sense uh, for you. It does. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> I have no idea what happened. I promise I didn't touch anything. But you know. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, okay. So you know, we were talking about. I showed you the player, and these spike proteins on the round virus will bind to a receptor. And it kind of invites it into the cell and by interfering with some of the protective mechanisms within the cell, all of this damage occurs. You get leaky vessels, you get uh, destruction of the tissues and, uh, you know, and Rob's story is very classic for severe end stage infection where multi organs are involved, severe respiratory failure. Uh, and the only way because the lungs, when you look at an x ray have become filled, it's called a whiteout, it's filled with fluid. They require this extra corporeal oxygenation to maintain life. And the reason that they put these individuals in a prone position on their stomach was that it kind of helped drain the lungs, you know, just by gravity itself. And so quite often all that could happen is that uh, the person needed to be intubated, supported however they could, including dialysis if needed, until the infection began to clear. Uh, so that's kind of how this happens. You know, the cell, in its wisdom, invites this uh, uh, nice-looking virus into its system, and then all, all havoc breaks loose. So what is long COVID? It's just, by CDC definition, it's a range of new, recurrent, or ongoing health problems people can experience four or more weeks after initial SARS-CoV-2 infection. So our definition is a little different than that in the United Kingdom, and they consider COVID infection to actually last from four to 12 weeks, and there's COVID, post-COVID 12 weeks after acute infection. Uh, that being said, they're one and the same infection with the same symptoms. Long COVID is now a condition protected by the American with Disabilities Act. And as time goes by, I'm sure there's going to be more and more information. I know Rob talked about these clinics. We have one here at OHSU in Portland that is a long COVID clinic. And uh, there's like uh, 200 different symptoms being collected. I mean, the range of symptoms is incredible. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, the severity of, for each person varies a great deal as well. Okay, so... Can, uh, are you guys able to advance the slide? Oh, there it goes. Oh, it's, so it's slow. So here are the statistics for COVID and long COVID. So in the United States, in the pandemic, 80 million people were infected. And out of those, 1 million individuals died. And in the world, 500 million people were infected with 6 million deaths. So when they talk about prevalence of long COVID, Prevalence is the number of cases in the, in the population divided by the population itself. So if you look at that, 10 to 30% of COVID individuals will develop long COVID. That's anywhere from eight to 24 million individuals. And then in the world, of course, 10 to 30% or 50 to 150 million. So this is not a small, uh, you know, post-viral syndrome. The SARS-CoV-1 
basically it was very limited and that virus itself has actually gone on to you know extinction okay great and so i have a graph for you sometimes visuals help a lot and uh you know if you look over here at uh, at the left of the of the graph itself you can see that the occult cubit infection uh, which is designated by the kind of reddish curve you know, it typically comes on the last four weeks and most individuals recover with no symptoms. For those individuals that develop long COVID, you can see that, you know, it'll go on and kind of smolder and it can be four to 12 weeks or longer. And once it's past 12 weeks, you now have chronic COVID. So these post-viral syndromes are certainly significant in that they can have long-term and if not and lifelong, you know, effects upon the individual. So that should give you an idea of what to, what to think about when you hear about long COVID syndrome. Just know it's been there, the individual did not recover, and now they have, you know, a whole range of symptoms and things that can affect their function. So who's likely to get this? The frequency and severity is unknown. It can be there with mild illness or even those that are asymptomatic. So sometimes have a, people have a positive COVID test and even with no symptoms, they can develop long COVID because the virus is in the system doing the cellular damage. Typically it's in ages 35 to 69, women greater than men. And you know, the risk factors and associations are not well understood. Uh, certainly it's new and I think over time, there will be more knowledge. There's a lot more knowledge now about chronic fatigue 40 years later than it is about long COVID. And it can definitely uh, reactivate SARS-CoV-2, Epstein-Barr virus. Uh, this sometimes you'll see people that have had prior Epstein-Barr virus infections uh, all of a sudden have a recrudescence and you have all the symptoms or it can actually morph into chronic fatigue syndrome. Diabetes and coronary disease. You know, I think a lot was said about people that had high risk or underlying impairments. Well, COVID can increase and make all of those impairments worse. And uh, the reason being that there are a lot more receptors in these tissues that the virus can actually, actually attach to. And quite often other viruses are uh, reactivated and also autoantibodies. So sometimes autoimmune disease is also triggered or exacerbated by long COVID. So what causes this? Uh, the pathophysiology. So physiology is kind of like what's happening at the cellular level. And of course, pathology is you know, obviously not good. It's bad. So a persistent virus or viral remnant. So the cell wasn't able to clear that and the virus is continuing to trigger off that pathway of chronic inflammation. Uh, individuals can develop autoimmunity. Uh, you know, when you breathe in this respiratory droplet with COVID, it can trigger off a myriad of different responses within the body. And often there is a dysregulated gut microbiome. What this is, you know, the colon, our intestinal system is this uh, giant world of bacteria, uh, yeast, fungi, and it's all interplaying. It has to do with absorption and how we feel and how it functions. So if you alter the gut microbiome, it can also exacerbate you know, symptoms. There's often latent reactivation of Epstein-Barr, and this is myalgic encephalomyelitis, which is chronic fatigue syndrome. And, you know, there is a, a ruling out that we, helps us deal with that syndrome. I think the big thing for all these is awareness. And quite often, I think, uh, especially in today's medicine and everyone's kind of, uh, you know, has limited time to really investigate things that often these somewhat vague symptoms are not linked to a real uh, an identifiable cause. Perhaps the virus continues to replicate. And of course, like Rob talks about, Residual organ damage. Well, uh, you know, certainly I had a slide that showed you normal lungs that looked nice and healthy and it contracted, scarred up lung. And often some people have actually moved on into lung transplantation, either single or double. And anyone that's been in the hospital or ICU a long time, 
will have consequences of just lying there, uh, atrophy, uh, what's called critical illness, myopathy, muscle apathy, or even neuropathy. So there's a long course of recovery once the individual survives the acute infection. And then the mitochondria, uh, everyone remembers this from biology, I'm sure, but the mitochondria are the powerhouses for the body. They make energy and they, you know, through a, a whole series of uh, biochemical changes will create energy for the cell and for the body. So it only stands to reason if the mitochondria are affected by COVID, it's going to affect the person's body as well. So what are the characteristic symptoms? So let's, it's kind of broken down into exertional, things that we can measure, obviously, and the non-exertional, things that are a little bit more subjective. So people have pain, muscle, chest, joint, head, you know, myalgias, they're tired, fatigued. You know, they're just not able to get going. The chest is tight, palpitations, tachycardia is a rapid heartbeat, cough, shortness of breath, the gastrointestinal issues that we just talked about, the gut, gut dysbiosis, anosmia is loss of smell. Uh, that got to be more uh, commonly recognized as the infection went along. And in fact, a lot of uh, healthcare agencies would ask an individual, have you lost your sense of smell? Because that was kind of a, a soft indication of perhaps a COVID infection. And then nerve abnormalities. Things that can't be measured are depression, anxiety, memory, loss of concentration, brain fog, you know, just can't quite get your thoughts together and kind of get your head to clear, sleep disruption, and post-trauma. And then kind of leading up to today's presentation, someone had hoped I could talk more about mental illness in COVID. And I did some research, and it really, as kind of expected, not a lot of information out there of how COVID maybe under affects, uh, can affect an underlying mental health disorder. But if you look at the non-exertional symptoms and depression and anxiety, I can only think that it would make that particular illness worse and therefore be more limiting to the individual. So what do we know about these symptoms? They're intermittent in nature. Sometimes they overlap with other impairments, which makes it really hard to, you know, separate them out. They cluster during periods of improvement or worsening. And in particular, the thing that makes long COVID different than chronic fatigue is that they happen after periods of post-exertional malaise and stress. And malaise, by definition, is an uncomfortable feeling. You just don't feel right. You know, I feel kind of icky, that kind of thing. Lack of energy that can't be explained. That's really not the same as being tired. Malays, you know, we've all had it as, you know, as a virus is coming on, just not feeling right. So what happens to a person with long COVID when they get a COVID vaccination? Well, people that are vaccinated have 50% less chance of having long COVID. So that was always a plus if you uh, are vaccinated. People that had long COVID that got vaccinated typically had more side effects than the general population and they lasted longer. So I know from my own experience, I didn't feel very well for a couple of days after each of my COVID vaccines, kind of had headaches, body aches. Well, if you had long COVID, it would only be worse. And then those individuals with long COVID that had a vaccination, most reported no change in symptoms, some reported improved symptoms, and a small minority uh, definitely said they were worse. So certainly this slide points out that vaccination in, in uh, association with developing long COVID is an important way to prevent that. So what else can we see with long COVID? Post-exertional malaise, PIM. This is kind of the hallmark symptom. And I'm gonna get, oh, my slide changed. What happened here? These are talking about all of the different body systems and related conditions where, where they may be able to find the condition. So I yeah. forwarded that slide. Did you forward it? Yep. You oh, okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> all right. 
So the post-exertional malaise, it's uh, increased or mental exertion. Typically on a good day, I think we've all done that, you know, we get out there and we just do everything we can and the next day we pay for it. Well, that kind of happens with individuals with long COVID, it's post-exertional malaise. It's disabling exhaustion out of proportion to the effort exerted. It can be triggered by minimal activities such as bathing or dressing or even using your mind. Some people have described mental fatigue and it usually occurs 12 to 72 hours after the exertion. So chronic fatigue, it's like you're always tired with long COVID, the fatigue and malaise comes on maybe the next day and can last for up to 72 hours. It's not fatigue, it's feeling poorly, weariness, lack of energy, and at time, as I mentioned, they can also meet uh, the uh, definition for chronic fatigue syndrome. A little different. Okay, oh, there we go. Cognitive impairment, brain fog. So, you know, certainly uh, if you have a cognitive issue, it can only be worse, and if you don't, uh, it's gonna be there. It's like post-concussion syndrome. So these individuals have trouble with word retrieval, working memory, reasoning, problem solving, attention, executive function, you know, kind of multitasking and spatial planning. So, you know, if you're having brain fog and sometimes people with fibromyalgia will also describe that or people on chemotherapy, you're just not as mentally sharp and functional. There it goes. So what else do we see? We see that the autonomic nervous system, auto means self, it kind of takes care of us. It keeps our blood pressure up. It runs our heart rate. It does everything that we do, breathing, everything that we just don't think about. And if it's affected, you can imagine that it's gonna affect uh, blood pressure in particular, you know, vessels themselves. And so I think people have seen POTS which is postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. And so basically what happens when these individuals stand up, their blood pressure is unable to, and it can't sustain a normal blood pressure. And typically they'll stand up and the blood pressure can drop as they're standing. And as in a way to compensate for that, the heart will increase the heart rate to try and then build up the blood pressure. So by definition, you have to have 30 beats per minute or greater than 120, greater than 120 beats within the first 10 minutes to actually have this by definition. But certainly we all have some for if we stand up quickly, you may feel lightheaded. And that's orthostasis that is very similar to POTS itself. And people that have COVID will often have uh, symptoms suggestive of dysautonomia. Small fiber neuropathies. Again, Rob talked about neuropathy. So, you know, it's really kind of good to talk about after a person that's had this because you see all of these things are there and typically can express themselves typically more in older individuals. And uh, uh, that is a little different because the flu, the Spanish flu in 1918 was an influenza A and it affected younger individuals that had less antibodies. So it's very, very different. And even then, the mask was a controversial thing and they all, all, all they could do is open the windows and let fresh air in. So people with the small fiber neuropathy that numbness and tingling, pain, often you'll see it in people with diabetes. And these fibers will actually, you know, mediate pain, heat, thermal, and they can have burning, prickling or shooting, aching pain, dizziness when you stand up, abnormal sweating. So you can see that this long haul COVID has far reaching implications and can affect almost all body systems and therefore function. Mass cell activization, if you've ever had hives or flushing, you know, broken out in a hive in response to something, trouble breathing, headache, brain fog, these are all mast cells and they kind of hold uh, a, a special chemical that when released into the body will create this response. And again, the mast cells, if they're activated irregularly, will then cause these symptoms, which are all very, uh, you know, uh, limiting in themselves and also quite scary for the individual. So this can happen too as a consequence of long COVID. All right. And we talked about our energy store, our mitochondria. 
And SARS itself, and remember, it's severe acute respiratory syndrome, SARS, COVID-2, that RNA, which is kind of the DNA of a virus, that's how it replicates and how it mutates, it specifically targets our nuclear, I mean, our nuclear energy source, for, for lack of a better definition. It's our energy source at the cellular level. So you can imagine anything that gets in the way of that, you have decreased energy production, you feel tired, uh, there's decreased antiviral signaling and the immune response. Uh, therefore, you know, this is going to continue. It might hijack the mitochondrial system and turn it into viral uh, replication, not let it do its job. Inflammation may occur. And, you know, the ability to support the immune response. All of these things are done by the mitochondria. And they don't ask for much, but they want to make sure there's no infection to affect them. And finally, mitochondria, uh, they will actually begin to not look like a little cellular mitochondria. And if they die, the individual will have chronic symptoms. And so thank you. Yeah, there was, I had some more to say, but time is limited. But I think that gives you an idea of what COVID is. Why, why this happened and what it does and what log COVID is. And the more that, that we can recognize it and kind of hone out those symptoms, I think the better you can do about getting the evidence we need to make these decisions. So I really thank you for your time and sorry about the earlier gremlins. I was here talking to myself, which is a common thing I do. But anyway, I'm gonna turn it over. Uh, thank you and I'll be around for questions. Yeah, well, thanks, Dr. Pritchard, and for raising our awareness, taking us back to maybe high school biology class. It's very much needed. And we're going to hear from Dr. Pritchard uh, in a little bit, who's going to go through a case study with us. So now we're going to turn it over to Julie uh, Kuja uh, with DDS in Nevada, who's going to give the DDS perspective. Thank you. <clears throat> And I'm going to kind of go through my slides relatively quick because the SSA emergency message is really kind of directed towards adjudicators and how we adjudicate and giving us guidance on how we establish an, an impairment um, of of COVID, uh, you know, that it clearly outlines that we need objective medical evidence from an acceptable medical source to establish an MDI for COVID um, and that they that a report of a positive viral test is what is is how you diagnose it. Um, you can use diagnostic testing with findings consistent with COVID to, in your argument. Uh, whenever you uh, say someone had a home test or it's not documented that they had to test, um, they also give us guidance for uh, certain factors that we want to kind of avoid from using as reference false positives or antibody testing, which doesn't actually diagnose an infection. Um, and gives, gives us guidance on the diagnosis codes to use um, within the program. Um, and the other thing that the policy gives us guidance on is severity and duration. Um, COVID claims have to meet the same or de definition of disabled by the Social Security Administration. So we um, given some guidelines on how to demonstrate the severity of impairments and the functional loss uh, um, onto a person. And that kind of gives us um, a guidance on how we can make a durational um, statement without having have hold the case for 12 months to to meet the durational clause. Um, so a lot of the the EM is really kind of guided for uh, particularly for our job and um, not necessarily the easiest thing to kind of talk about and the with the general public. Um, and I just want to make sure that we give some time to go in over the case study. Um, so. Here we go. Sure, Julie. So we'll bring up the case study and Dr. Pritchard, if you want to uh, camera up and Julie's going to um, walk us through the case study and then you'll chime in and both of you kind of talk about the outcome. Okay. So here's our case study. Prior to getting COVID-19 in April 2020, the claimant reported working 50 hours a week and enjoyed traveling. Now she feels like she's wearing a lead weight around her body. After doing household chores, she suffers profound exhaustion for days and her heart races on occasion. 
She has trouble finding words, staying focused, multitasking, and is mentally exhausted going to the store. She has undergone an extensive workup by cardiologists and pulmonologists. She was told her symptoms were anxiety-based and told and was told, think happy thoughts. Um, she is unable to work, feels like a burden on her daughter, and dismissed by the medical community. She doesn't understand what's wrong with her, is scared that she might die, and contemplates whether life is worth living. Does she have long COVID? So if we go back to the slide before, uh, am I running this now? Here, oh, can we go back to the, uh, the first page of the um, case study? Yeah, the case study, sorry, there we go. So let's look at that. Uh, here's a very, you know, healthy, active, uh, very uh, involved person, and that's very typical for COVID, and it was very typical for chronic fatigue. And she got sick and, you know, had a positive test, so we sort of are assuming that. And now she's got this lead weight, you know, lack of energy. She's got malaise. And, you know, she did household chores and did uh, no, without problem, but then she has the profound exhaustion for days. That's the post exertional malaise. So part of this, at least for me, is to pick out what these statements, what they represent. She had heart races. Remember we talked about palpitations and tachycardia. Uh, she has brain fog. She can't find words, be focused. She can't multitask, you know, that's that executive function. We do that every day, don't even think about it. Uh, driving is a good example, you know, it's just like that. Hopefully not too automatic, but it's kind of automatic as you've done it. And if she goes to the store, she's tired. So these are all kind of symptoms we talked about in the slides before. And again, Without a good impairment or diagnosis, they're just it's just symptoms. So it's very important that we have that diagnosis. And it's also not uncommon when you look at the next two sentences that she has a big workup and they just kind of are saying you're, you're anxious and you just need to think happy thoughts and it'll go away. And unfortunately, I think the medical community can be very dismissive uh, of uh, things that are kind of vague and hard to understand. And I think uh, uh, earlier Jessica talked about being persistent. And I think that's really the key is to um, be persistent, collect that information. Um, did you want to comment any further, Julie? We'll go to the next slide. Oh. So what do you think, Julie? You want to take it from here? <laughs> well, I think definitely the signs and symptoms are that the, the claimant has long COVID syndrome. Um, now, whether uh, or not we have enough information on these slides to, you know, adjudicate a claim is, is another thing. But yeah, I think definitely um, you have the signs and the symptoms that would lead you to believe. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And, you know, she's not able to work and then she is depressed. The last part is she may want to die. She's scared. So depression. So, you know, this little vignette kind of incorporates how I think a lot of individuals present. And I think the key piece is to make sure that you, we can actually document a COVID infection before this, because then it all makes sense. Um, but I, I think a lot of patients uh, are not, and also claimants because of the vague nature of some of these syndromes probably don't get the best uh, decision because is there's this hard to put it all together. So the more information, the better. I guess that's my take home. Yeah. Okay. Great. Uh, I think um, what we do now is we <laughs> want to move into Q&A right yeah. now. So we have some questions that have already come in um, that I think we've answered some of those. But if folks want to, in the Q&A box, put some questions in directed to uh, Dr. Pritchard and Julie, um, we can get to as many uh, as possible. 
Uh, again, if we don't get to your question, we will, um, you know, get get a response to you after the webinar. Um, but we we did have again lots of uh, people thanking you, um, Cass. <laughs> from Central City. Thank you, Pritchard. Dr. Pritchard, I know you know Cass. Um, so I wanted to give you a shout out. So a lot of thanks for sharing your knowledge and raising awareness. And Julie for explaining, you know, from a DDS perspective, what you know now. We do have some complex questions about listings. And I, I kind of knew that would come up. Like, what listings do we look for, especially if maybe you're trying to equal a listing, you know, right? Because folks at step three can meet or equal a listing and there's no long COVID listing. So uh, do you have any thoughts on, you know, how SOAR uh, practitioners can kind of look at the listings as they meet with their applicants who are discussing certain symptoms? and how they can, you know, see if they can't meet one of the listings or possibly equal a listing. Well, the issue with the listings is that they require chronic conditions. And so that COVID a lot of times um, it doesn't, isn't associated with a chronic condition. So it can make meeting or equating a listing very difficult. Right. Yeah, I agree with Julia. In fact, uh, part of the uh, directive is that we cannot equal a uh, respiratory failure listing 1314 because it's acute, not chronic. And also it's very difficult, you know, if COVID exacerbates the underlying COPD or, or heart problems, you know, maybe that makes their uh, coronary disease worse or heart failure worse. I would recommend then looking at those listings rather than trying to equal something with COVID. So I think you're going to be, you know, we're going to be more successful long-term looking at what got exacerbated and then also, you know, can we allow them some other way? But because, uh, you know, in particular with chronic acute, you know, we have to have a chronic lung disease to have respiratory failure to meet the listing. So I, I think we've been sort of in a way discouraged from trying to equal, but I would look at the end organ affected and see if you can allow that way, because we know that there's also renal uh, consequences. Some people have, loved, have been on hemodialysis and they can be allowed that way. Uh, so there's a lot of ways that this can happen. Oh, God. So we have a question that came in um, for long haulers. Um, they see a lot of folks with brain fog and still don't have a sense of taste or smell. This person since March of 2020, would they be considered one to file uh, for SSDI? And this is um, brain fog and loss of sense of smell. Could that person potentially qualify for social security disability benefits? You want to take that, Julie, to start with? Go ahead. Well, well, definitely, if the brain fog is to an extent where you can't navigate outside of your home without getting lost, definitely, I would say that that's a brain fog that I would consider a potentially disabling brain fog. Um, now, if you just go into a room and can't remember why you got into that room, I think that's pretty common. So, I mean, it's it would all d depend on the severity and the duration of the brain fog. Yeah, I agree. I think it's very hard to give you a yes or no answer. I mean, anybody can apply. There's, there's no reason they can't, but it's a matter of ultimately, what are the combination of these symptoms and effect on body systems and brain fog could make uh, something worse under the mental listings, but it, it all comes down to the impact on a person's ability to function every day. Uh, so, you know, the more symptoms and the more information about how that condition affects the person's ability to function is really the key, I think, and, and you know, for these individuals that want to file, but they can always file. And then, and then we just kind of start collecting the evidence from there. We have um, some questions that are coming in that are, are really just about documenting symptoms. Um, and I think folks, may have asked some of these questions before, Dr. Pritchard, you were done, your presentation, and maybe even Julie. 
And it's about where to get that documentation from and, and how maybe the SOAR practitioner can help get some testing, for example. Um, is there certain testing that could help, um, you know, further document the claim? Well, and again, yeah. We've talked a little bit about, and it sounded like through the VA, uh, maybe Rob and some others are part of these uh, post-COVID clinics that are researching and studying COVID and maybe helping with post-COVID types of treatment. How, how, in your experience, are you seeing documentation coming from places like these centers? And how has that helped, you know, make Make well, uh, actually, yes, uh, I have seen several claims uh, with information from the long COVID clinic at OHSU, uh, Oregon Health Science University in Portland. And it's very good because they have a comprehensive history. They usually have, you know, the evidence of the antibody tests that we need to establish the diagnosis. You know, a home test, unfortunately, really won't do it. Uh, yeah, it's a standalone, oh, I have COVID. And what they do is they do a comprehensive evaluation. They do mental health, psychiatric, they do uh, pulmonary, and uh, they just have this kind of uh, comprehensive approach to helping these people understand their condition and recovering. So, of course, documentation from a center like that, and I believe almost every state will have that or something close to it within the near future, um, just because it's going to be so prevalent. But that kind of documentation would be essential. But more than anything, did they have a, a positive test? And, you know, did they seek care? Or can we get enough information in retrospect to say that it was a COVID infection? Um, so sometimes for me, you have to be a little creative and use the information you have. But those centers would have the excellent information and certainly the provider or providers that uh, that individual saw for COVID and, and their treatment would be critical, I think. And in my experience, a lot of times what I see, people will have the completely normal cardiac workup, normal pulmonary workup, but yet they have these visibly observable um, dyspnea on exertion that doesn't match the physiological testing. So. Um, I wouldn't get hung up on trying to find a test that's going to to necessarily um, sh to quantify the symptoms because a lot of times with COVID you have symptoms that are outside of what would be expected based on all the other physiological findings. Boy, that's a great point. Uh, in fact, I have seen a couple of claimants recently where they had normal tests and their saturations, you know, a little clippy on your finger are normal, but they can't walk across the room. And that's all part of long haul COVID. So certainly the key part of that is to make sure that they had this infection. And because, and then a lot of it's education. You really got to open your mind to, boy, this person had this infection and look at what's happening to them. And, uh, and as Julie said, a lot of the standard tests, echocardiogram, those kind of things are normal. But the uh, symptomatic part of that isn't. And that chronic viral infection, you know, if you have the flu-like illness, but just think about it all the time in your system, it's kind of like chronic hepatitis. It's this low-grade, you know, uh, infection that's kind of affecting your, your system in general. So uh, that's a really great point, Julie, um, that a lot of times, as I mentioned, I think in one of the slides, that the symptoms are far out of proportion to the uh, testing and also to the degree of activity prior to the onset of this post-assertional malaise. And we had a, a question come in, and there are a few questions still around that long COVID diagnosis. And if DDS sends an applicant to a consultative and exam a CE, will that CE examiner make a COVID diagnosis? Julie. Not likely. Um, and, it's not, and it's not likely that they, I, I mean, they, what they would be doing is basically getting us physiological findings of, you know, how somebody is limited. That's more likely why we're sending them to an exam. Um, they wouldn't necessarily be able to diagnose, I mean, we wouldn't send them to do a test for to diagnose COVID. Um, and we wouldn't expect them 
to necessarily diagnose long COVID, but we could definitely use the evidence and the claim and, and that exam to support a diagnosis of long COVID. Sure. Yeah, I think anything's helpful, but I, I do know uh, in particular that SSA is very uh, specific in that an antibody test, you know, antibodies reflect a prior infection is not going to be acceptable uh, because it's temporarily, you don't really know when that happened. You know, we all have antibodies and if everyone went down and had their uh, lab work done, they'd have antibodies to cytomite gallovirus and all these things you had when you were a child, they're always there. So I think it's a matter of the, you know, the, the overall preponderance of evidence and uh, standalone exams are difficult without other documentation. Yeah, and, and, and similar types of questions. Um, and I, I think, you know, folks are so, you know, we know Social Security needs a diagnosis. And we also need to see how that, you know, causes impairment and the severity of that impairment. Um, so could you talk a little bit about, and, and one of the things our practitioners do is they help applicants get into treatment, you know, whether it's a mental status evaluation or, or to see an internist who can then refer to specialists. So I'm assuming just like for folks, you know, regardless of COVID, you know, getting information from specialists is really important to DDS when you evaluate, evaluate claims. Um, so is that something you're looking for as well? If individuals, you know, do have you know, COVID-19 infection symptoms, but it's affecting their, you know, um, respiratory system or infecting, you know, their immune system or urinary system, you would like to see records from specialists to really, really help evaluate that claim. So would you suggest individuals getting, you know, treatment beyond maybe their, you know, internal medicine provider or their doctor for more specialty testing? Would that help? You want to start, Julie? Well, I mean, so... so it it would depend on the case, and I mean, it would be definitely something that I, that would be a question I would pass off to the MC is if if we needed any more additional specialized testing. Um, I think with COVID, especially because it's it's a manifestation of severe symptoms, you know, after the infection, and, and what we really need are more of a documentation uh, that uh, of the symptoms. I, I I don't know that necessarily getting a specialist evaluation is going to um, help anything. Right. I don't know that I would recommend it. <laughs> mm -hmm. I, I mean, certainly if they've gone to see someone, kind of like in our, our case example, we would need that information. Um, but Julie's correct. I think this is a symptomatic, you know, post-viral syndrome. And unfortunately, there's no good testing available now. Uh, we only can think of, well, well, if someone has POTS, yeah, you can do a tilt table test and get that. But I think the MC or our physician could also diagnose that just by using the criteria. So I don't think we necessarily need specialty information. We just need that key ability for someone to say, yes, this was a COVID infection, and then document as minutes as you can about the symptoms of the syndrome and the functional impact on that person, because that's really where the decision is. What is the impact on their ability to function and ultimately work um, more than anything? Yeah. Yeah. And, and then questions relating to establishing impairment with long COVID and, you know, it's not lost on us that, you know, many individuals are not talking about, you know, sore applicants, you know, pe individuals being referred to an agency, maybe themselves, um, maybe even a family member, but, but themselves who are healthcare workers, many of our sore practitioners who are on the front lines, like early in the pandemic. So a few questions are about, you know, individuals that, you know, before there was even a COVID test, maybe in early 2020, uh, you know, had COVID, didn't go to the hospital, may, you know, one individual here, uh, just this person just regained some of their taste and smell, they're constantly tired, they have brain fog, a heart murmur. Would this individual, and again, like Dr. Pritchard said, anyone that can apply for disability benefit, but here's a person who's a healthcare worker that may be considering applying for social security disability, um, but 
you know, doesn't actually have documentation that they tested positive back then. So can you just review about getting up what you need in terms of a positive test or not? Uh, well, th that's a really a difficult <laughs> question, but um, I do think that if a person has the classic presentation of COVID, you know, symptom-wise, you know, fever, sore throat, you know, maybe pneumonia, all these things that go with it. You know, I, I, I'm going to get myself in trouble here, but, you know, I think I would be able to retrospectively put that together. So, again, it comes down to documentation. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I think we do have the ability, if clinically it all comes together, to establish that impairment. Because uh, I agree, not everybody uh, got a test. And I think later in the course of the pandemic, people said, oh, I have this. I, I mean, we did so many home tests. Um, so I, it's not impossible to do that. I don't know. What do you think about that, Julie? Well, I think having adjudicated during the pandemic, I can tell you that after knowing about COVID, I could easily identify symptoms, you know, that were in the records in 2019 before we had an actual identification for COVID where you can make that assumption, but I definitely not during the time while I was going through, but I can also say, you know, during the time of the pandemic, getting medical treatment was also something that was kind of hard. You know, lots of hospitals were filled. If you weren't in need of a ventilator, you were kind of sent home, you know, to deal with your symptoms. And I've had cases where, you know, I've had people who have long haul symptoms um, and we use those presentations and, you know, even though they were sent home, you know, to kind of show and document, Hey, they had extreme symptoms. They were seen at the ER. They weren't in an emergency life-saving situation, so they were sent home. But at least you can use those kinds of things to document. But definitely the pandemic caused all kinds of different um, just complications with trying to do any kind of medical documentation. Right. Yeah, so I what I try and do is that if I think the evidence is pervasive and consistent with that diagnosis, I, I'm going to use that. Um, so, again, it's a matter of, Getting that information about the acute illness, um, it can't be a self-diagnosis. We need it. You know, it's we're evidence-based. We need the evidence. And that is, there is a way that we can establish COVID as a diagnosis or impairment without testing. And as Julie mentioned, for so long, some individuals either didn't seek care or if they did, they were turned away. Uh, and then, of course, we got into the age of telemedicine. So, you know, physical documentation isn't good. Uh, you know, examinations, right? It's hard to listen to someone's lungs over the phone, I think. But, you know, uh, so from that standpoint, I think good documentation of the acute infection can establish that impairment. And, and like Julie mentioned, it's a matter of being aware uh, uh, certainly my awareness has gone up a lot and I can see these things. So the, the whole part of it is education and kind of picking these things out, thinking this looks like long COVID, especially all these symptoms with no good explanation, but maybe a recent prior or prior infection. Yeah. And it, it sounds like keeping a diary can be very helpful as symptoms, you know, wax and wane and, yeah. and, you know, keeping a diary on pain or, you know, whatever it might be, can be really, really helpful to you as well. Helpful evidence. So maybe uh, suggest applicants keep a diary. Sure. Of their symptoms. Because, you know, all of that information is used if there is an, a, an impairment that can reasonably support the symptoms. So sure, diaries are great. Uh, you know, it's, it, it's hard. You have to document the subjective, but that's kind of what has to happen. Right. Well, this is all very helpful. Uh, we do have more questions that might come to you in the future um, as we package these oh. up. Um, some are, are quite complex. Some are asking, what's an EM? So here it is. It's an emergency. <laughs> so here's some additional resources for you. The right. 
to the bottom of the post-COVID care centers, uh, there's a link where you can click on your state and find a center maybe in your area where you can connect an applicant uh, to to get some of those evaluations and, and, and treatment, um, et cetera. So check that one out too. And, and we know that we are always trying to reach the most vulnerable population. So doing outreach, maybe connecting to centers like this and and one of the uh, plans we have is to add on to our medical summary report interview a guide to ask uh, questions about COVID, you know, kind of dig a little deeper about symptoms and, and such um, as you will begin to see more applicants with long COVID uh, condition. So check out our resources. Um, Please uh, do our evaluation. Um, it's really important. You can also add questions on here as well. And again, I just want to, you know, thank all of our panelists. You know, Jessica and Rob who had to leave. Of course, Julie from uh, DDS, and who provides such great um, information uh, to folks, not only within your state but nationally. And, and it's great to meet Dr. Pritchard too, who does outstanding work in this area, and you did a lot to raise all of our awareness here. So with that, I just want to thank everyone today. Have a great rest of your afternoon and stay safe. And we look forward to seeing you on our next uh, webinar in February. I think February 8th on collaborations with medical providers. So I think perfect. Thank you, everybody. Yeah. Bye -bye. Thank you. Thank you.